Well, I want you to think about uh, Prince Rupert in British Columbia. It's got a ferry terminal there that needs probably 10 to $20 million uh, worth of renovations, the upgrades, those kinds of things, for an Alaskan ferry service that leases the ferry terminal. The problem is that the Alaskan Ferry Service is American. The funding is likely to come from an entity that will invoke Buy America. They have to buy American goods. What's Canada going to do about that? Well, Ian Lee joins us, the Surprise School of Business. He's actually in Warsaw. Hi, Ian. I guess it's good evening to you. It is, it is, but I'm more than pleased to speak with you again. Okay, Ian, what do you make of this uh, controversy between that's brewing, seemingly, between Canada and the United okay. States? Uh, this has been accumulating. Um, uh, uh, it, it is getting worse, um, and I, I don't mean at all to be uh, partisan, but I, I think that um, uh, because, first off, I'm not an American and I don't vote in American elections, but under the Obama administration, I think it's fair to say that both the Congress and President Obama have been steadily ratcheting up the Buy American provisions and have been more and more willing to engage in protectionism that certainly violates the spirit of NAFTA, and I think some would argue it violates some, some of the uh, protectionist uh, measures, violate the actual letter uh, of NAFTA. So this is not good for Canada, and I don't think I don't, uh, that it's good for the United States because protectionism uh, ultimately harms uh, both sides. Canada is looking to invoke what they call the Foreign Extraterritorial Measures Act, FEMA, if you will, different connotation than you have in the United States for the same acronym, but still that would allow them to uh, overrule the American government, if you will. It hasn't been invoked since 1992. Is this a little bit stronger than you need a position to take, do you think, Ian? Um, I'm, I'm going to say no, uh, and the reason why, if this was the first time that the American government had done this to us, it would be clearly an overreaction. But this is going on in sector after sector, uh, in terms of uh, Canadian companies trying to uh, sell to the U.S., and they're doing it at the federal and the state and the, and the municipal level with an to, uh, to an increasing degree. And two points very quickly. Uh, this is uh, an exception because it is on Canadian land. Most American procurement, uh, which, uh, to which the Buy American applies, of course, is dealing with uh, federal procurement in the United States on federal land. So, you know, they can say, look, it's our land, it's our country, we can do what we want. Uh, in this instance, the fact that it, there is some leverage because it is on Canadian land, point one, and the second point is I think it sends a symbolic message uh, across the, the, the White House saying, look, you know, we don't appreciate this, we don't like it, we're pushing this too far with a very close ally, and I think it will, uh, it probably won't get them to reverse uh, their policy, but it, it's going to attract their attention. And I think people in the Congress will start to pay a little bit more attention because it is such an unusual step for our, our Canada to do this to our closest ally, the United States. Yeah, and, but we're seeing it all over the place, and your point is well made. <coughs> New Jersey, for instance, they are invoking Buy America on the procurement side. Should Canada put in place a Buy Canada rule? I hope not, um, um, because what we're doing is we're conceding uh, to protectionism. I have been a very vocal, as you know, you and I have talked about this before. I, I just despise protectionism uh, because protectionism, let's be clear, it falls on you and me. In other words, we are the losers individually in Canada and in the United States. In the American instance, they're forced to buy higher cost uh, output from American contractors. Who pays for the higher cost? Why, that would be the American taxpayer. And so the solution is to uh, negotiate a reinvigorated NAFTA, call it NAFTA 2.0, or uh, push forward to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is sometimes being called a uh, souped-up NAFTA, to uh, try to uh, cover off these loopholes that allow the Americans and other countries to engage in this protectionism, which, as I said, hurts not only us, but hurts their own people. Yeah, but the problem with the negotiation, as we saw, for instance, in the softwood lumber dispute, it can drag on for years. It can, it can, but, you know, I, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a better solution. I'm not trying to be an academic uh, theoretician here. It's a, it's a structurally better solution because it gets to the, to the source of the problem. 
And if we nearly retaliate, so now they're going to be uh, hurting their uh, taxpayers and citizens. We're going to be hurting our taxpayers and citizens. Neither side has got, is better off. In fact, both sides are worse off. So that's why it's better to try to, uh, at least, if we can't get the TPP approved, then maybe we should be looking back, uh, falling back to uh, renegotiating NAFTA, if only to try to in, uh, remove the, these protectionist uh, policies on both sides, because not only are they an irritant to both sides, but as I said, they hurt all of us and they reduce our, our standard of living. They don't augment it or increase it. Ian, great to talk to you. I really appreciate your time from so far away. My appreciation. Thank safe. you very much. And safe.